My name is Peter Thomas, President of Resource Compliance. In this short video, we'll provide instructions for completing an annual mechanical integrity inspection of a heat exchanger using the checklist from Appendix B of IIAR Standard 6. The checklist contained in the IIAR 6 Appendix B are derived from a legacy document named IIAR Bulletin Number 109. For years, the Bulletin 109 checklists, or B109s, served as the gold standard for documenting annual mechanical integrity inspections for ammonia refrigeration equipment. In 2019, IIAR retired Bulletin 109 when the first edition of Standard 6 was published. Standard 6 addresses the minimum requirements for inspection, testing, and maintenance of ammonia refrigeration systems and includes slightly altered versions of the B109s in Appendix B. The checklists are typically two pages. The first page contains contact and equipment information, and the second page has the inspection checklist. While all the information on the second page will change year to year with the equipment inspection, much of the information on the first page should stay the same. For this reason, you may only have to fill out the first page for each piece of equipment once. For subsequent years, you should only have to fill out the second page. The simplest part of completing a heat exchanger checklist is filling out the contact information. Each IIAR6 checklist requires the inspector to indicate the location, owner, and physical address of the system. The contact's name and phone number should be the facility representative responsible for ensuring the inspection is completed. Additionally, the inspector must write his or her own name and the date of the inspection. The ID, or tag number, belongs in the upper right corner and can typically be found on the equipment label or PNID. Next, the inspector should indicate the type of heat exchanger being inspected. This is a shell and tube heat exchanger, so in this example, the uppermost box would be checked. In this example, a plate and frame heat exchanger was being inspected, so the corresponding box would be checked. In this section entitled Function, we will check the box for chiller, since the purpose of this heat exchanger is to reduce the temperature of a glycol solution. Much of the information requested in this section, titled Equipment Data and Limits, can be obtained from the heat exchanger nameplate. A camera can be useful for difficult to reach nameplates. The nameplate for this plate and frame heat exchanger is only partially legible, so the Manufacturer Data Report, or U1A form, can be referenced to fill out the information that cannot be deciphered on the nameplate. The questions referring to refrigerant side, refrigerant side maximum allowable working pressure, or MAWP, and secondary side MAWP are unique to the heat exchanger checklist. This is because the purpose of the heat exchanger is to transfer heat from one substance to another without direct contact of the substances. Therefore, one side of the heat exchanger pertains to the primary refrigerant, and the other side refers to the secondary substance being cooled. In this example, the refrigerant side will be ammonia and the secondary side will be a glycol solution. In this shell and tube heat exchanger, the MAWP and MDMT can be obtained directly from the nameplate. Because the plate and frame nameplate is partially covered by ice, we use the U1A to find some of the required information. The operating pressure, temperature, and normal liquid level will vary from heat exchanger to heat exchanger and will require operator input or design information about the system. The internal volume for a plate and frame heat exchanger should be provided by the manufacturer. Using the volume, the normal ammonia inventory is typically calculated using a spreadsheet. For shell and tube heat exchangers where ammonia is in the shell, the internal volume can be calculated by subtracting the total tube volume from the volume of the shell. If unknown, the heat exchanger's material can be determined from the Manufacturer Data Report or U1 form and Manufacturer Specification Sheet. The plates on this heat exchanger are constructed for stainless steel. This shell and tube heat exchanger is constructed of carbon steel. 
Most heat exchangers have a level indicator on the supplying vessel. In this example, the heat exchanger has a level column with bullseye so that box would be checked. The final information required on the first page of the checklist pertains to the heat exchanger's relief valves. The manufacturer, model, pressure setting, and capacity can be obtained from the relief valve's nameplate. If your facility reprints the same completed first page for each checklist, this is one data point on the first page that can change. Be sure to check if the relief valve installed matches what is listed on the form. If the heat exchanger is supplied by a surge drum, then the relief valves will be on the surge drum. For difficult to access relief valves, a camera with a high quality zoom lens can save a lot of time associated with moving ladders around. The relief valves are external to the equipment and terminate to atmosphere, so this configuration is categorized as external. The second page of the checklist contains 20 questions that should be answered yes, no, or not applicable. The wording of each question is such that a yes answer is always positive and a no answer indicates a deficiency. Some questions may not be applicable to a particular heat exchanger and should be answered NA. Item A asks if the equipment is labeled and has a legible nameplate. A proper label consists of the component name and ID number. Since this shell and tube heat exchanger label ID number is so small, that should be marked as an item to be addressed. The plate and frame heat exchanger nameplate is partially iced. This is not a deficiency but should still be indicated as a comment on the checklist. IIAR Standard 2 contains the requirements for heat exchanger nameplates. If the heat exchanger is ASME stamped like this one, the nameplate must comply with ASME requirements and contain all of the information required for pressure vessels. Items B and C ask if the heat exchanger is suitable for ammonia and operating within limits. The inspector must verify that the heat exchanger is not constructed of materials such as copper that would degrade if exposed to ammonia. The two primary operating limits of concern are pressure and liquid level. The pressure should be at least 10% lower than the relief valve set pressure. For difficult to access gauges, a selfie stick or a ladder may be needed to read the gauge. The liquid level in the heat exchanger must have adequate vapor space to accommodate liquid expansion if the heat exchanger experiences an unexpected heat load. Item D requires the inspector to verify that supports and anchorage are adequate. For a ground-mounted heat exchanger, the anchorage should be inspected to ensure that nuts are tight and free from corrosion. IIAR6 has a separate piping checklist, so the focus of this question is not on pipe supports. This plate and frame heat exchanger anchorage has an unacceptable level of corrosion that must be addressed. The heat exchanger should have safe access for normal service and maintenance. This heat exchanger is mounted to the ground, so safe access is acceptable for inspections, testing, and maintenance. The inspector must do a visual inspection of the entire heat exchanger to verify the equipment is free from excessive ice buildup, vibration, and leaks. Where possible, the heat exchanger should be inspected from all sides to avoid missing a deficiency. Item F asks specifically about ice buildup. Since the heat exchanger is on the low side of the system, it is common to see some ice buildup when the system is in operation, but excessive ice must be recorded and addressed. Item I inquires if the pipes are marked as required by IIAR Standard 2. Standard 2 requires piping mains, headers, and branches to be labeled with the following. The word ammonia should be printed in black letters, the physical state abbreviation LIQ or VAP, the relative pressure high or low, an arrow depicting the direction of flow in the pipe, a service abbreviation indicating the purpose of the pipe. Since the relief valve discharge pipe is not labeled, it does not conform and must be listed as a deficiency. 
Items J and K pertain to valves associated with the heat exchanger. All valves should be visually inspected. Deficiencies that should be recorded include corroded or painted stems, missing hand wheels, damaged seal caps, or excessive valve body corrosion. The heat exchanger must have sufficient instrumentation for monitoring the heat exchanger operating conditions per item L in the checklist. Heat exchanger should have a pressure gauge to monitor the ammonia pressure. The secondary coolant will often have inlet and outlet temperature probes as well as pressure gauges for any associated pumps. Items M and N ask if the heat exchanger certification drawing and manufacturer data report are on file. The data report, commonly referred to as a U1 form, we like to call the heat exchanger's birth certificate as it documents the important characteristics of when it was manufactured. For heat exchangers registered with the National Board, the data report can be obtained from the National Board website for a small fee. The certification drawings are provided by the heat exchanger's manufacturer and should be available on site. Item O asks the inspector if the heat exchanger is free from modifications. While this cannot be conclusively answered in the absence of a data report, the inspector can still look for indications that alterations have occurred. If there is evidence of equipment modifications, the appropriate checkbox in item P must be answered. Item Q asks the inspector to verify that the sight glass is adequately protected from traffic, equipped with 360 degree guards, and configured with internal check valves if the glass breaks. Bullseye columns like this example are exempt from having internal check valves per IIAR2, so we suggest noting that in the comment column. When a heat exchanger is insulated, the insulation system must be inspected per item R. Deficiencies such as jacket damage, breached vapor barrier, and ice buildup must be noted. This glycol heat exchanger is not insulated, so an A and not insulated should be checked. A thermal imaging camera can be helpful to identify insulation system failures that cannot be observed with the naked eye. For non-insulated heat exchangers like this one, item S requires the entire surface of the heat exchanger to be inspected and any surface corrosion or pitting must be recorded as a deficiency. This plate and frame heat exchanger has excessive dirt and debris on the top of the unit that requires corrective measures. While not specifically listed in the checklist, ultrasonic thickness testing can be used on a shell and tube heat exchanger to gauge the amount of material that has been lost due to corrosion. Thickness readings can be used to determine if the heat exchanger is fit for service and the remaining useful life. The checklist concludes with item T, which serves as a catch-all for other concerns that the inspector may have observed. The area below can be used to write a description of the deficiencies. This concludes the IIAR6 Appendix B Annual Inspection Checklist for Heat Exchangers. I trust you found this information useful. We have more videos on our channel about ammonia refrigeration and process safety management. Feel free to check them out if you're interested.